Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll begin with uh, bringing in some fire. So we light this candle and you're always welcome to bring a candle of your own or have some ritual object in front of you when we do these. It helps mark the entering into the sacred space and calls our attention to the fire, the fire in your belly, the fire in the belly that moves us, the fire in our hearts, fire in our hearts that radiates the great love. The fire in your brain that helps us clear out the cobwebs and uh, think more clearly and be open to knowing our deepest truth. And we honor the fire, not only that's within us, that comes from within us, the spirit within us. We honor the fire that's in Mother Earth fire that's in the sky as the sun and as the stars. And let's also be aware of the, all the elements, the water, the earth, the air. And as you breathe, let your attention be focused with your breath. Let your attention be focused with your breathing. Feel the air coming in through your nose and moving out through your nose. Just this shift that we always make at the beginning to experiencing directly in the here and now sensory awareness helps us to shift a little bit from the busyness of the thinking mind, the, the machine that's always worrying and generating thoughts, which is what it's there for. Just like your heart is there to keep beating and moving the blood through your body. And yet we have a choice about where we want to focus our attention in any moment. So allow your attention to just gently aim towards the experience of breathing and then let that be more and more what you're aware of. We know we take this, uh, this time now. Hello. This, this hour that we're taking Please mute yourself when you come in, if you haven't already. To really focus, to really focus on our own process, our own experience, the experience that we're having right in this moment. And for those of you who just came in, we're I suggested you focus on your breath and experience throughout your body, the sensory experience of now, of what it is that's going on right now inside you.
We also can allow our attention to be called, to choose to be with the interrelatedness that we have with all the realms of life. With the animals, the plants, and it, a simple picture in our minds of any one of these um, could be a, a lion or a bear or a deer or a rabbit or a mouse as an animal or a fish, a whale, a, a snake. Or trees, flowers, shrubs as plants. Just allowing our, our mind to open to the image of any one of these and then softly opening our senses to feel that, yes, we're part of that interconnected web of life that encircles the planet and permeates the planet. So allow your attention to come back to your whole body, to your breath, as if your whole body is breathing through your skin, not just through your nose or your mouth, but that as you breathe in and you breathe out, you feel your whole body's interrelationship with all of what's around you and inside you. So again, I say welcome, and it's good to see, see you here, those of you that I recognize, all of you. And I want to just call attention that we are, we are approaching the solstice, uh, the winter solstice, we call it. <clears throat> and so the light, the day, it's, I was thinking about it earlier and, and I, it's easy to say, well, it's the days are getting shorter up until a certain point and then they're gonna to start to get longer. And many people point attention to the sort of metaphor of that, 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 that the sense of lightness, the sense of, of the life force is, gets, more inward and more quiet, and then it starts to grow back. But when we think about quite literally what, what's happening, that this planet that we live on, and if we, we recognize that, and I think most of you are open to this notion that this planet is really a living being, Gaia. It's like what we would call a god or a goddess that has a body and the body of this planet, this Mother Earth, that is not only under us, but is all around us because the, the air, the atmosphere, is a part of the body of Mother Earth. And our physical bodies are part of the body of Mother Earth. And this sphere, including the atmosphere, is spinning around on an axis that's invisible to us, just like the axis that we practice with meditation. When, you, when you've worked with the meditation, I've called attention and you maybe have been working together on your own uh, with the fact that there's an energy axis that runs vertically through your body from above your head right down through the center of the top of your head and all the way down. And as I, as I talk about it right now, just allow your attention to be with that. And rather than thinking about anything, just allow your attention to be with that energy axis that balances your energy, your body, left and right and front and back. 
and recognize that you have this axis and your energy is like a, a, a mini sphere compared to the Earth's energy, which also, Mother Earth also has an axis that runs through the north and south of, of the planet and it spins around. We're on, on and in her body as it's spinning around and somehow that's spinning around because it's of the location of this brilliant, even greater being we call the sun, this incredible light source, energy source. As it's spinning, we start experiencing day and night. And we sort of govern our lives to a great extent around that simple act of the earth spinning. We, we get up in the morning, usually when it's light, or these days maybe it's dark uh, still, but it's getting light. And then we go to sleep at night, most people do. In any event, this cycle of daylight and nighttime is uh, part of our way we live, we count on it. And, and at the same time, as it's spinning on this axis, the Mother Earth is, is moving in an orbit that goes around that giant being we call the sun in, in such a way that at certain segments of, of that, that rotation, that revolution really around the sun, the days get longer or shorter, depending on the geometry of how the angle of that axis is tilted toward the sun or away, uh, in one way or another. And right now, where it's, it's moving around the sun in such a way that the, what we call day, when we see the sun, is shorter and shorter and shorter until it reaches this magical point that it starts to turn into where the days are starting to get longer. And that's going to happen next Monday. And so we'll have a meditation next Monday, if you can come, I hope you can come, and we'll, we'll focus the meditation on, on just that point of the solstice, uh, the turning, the, the light starts to get longer in our lives, more in more longer days. So, um, but right now we're sort of in that movement edging closer and closer to that solstice. And people all over the world noticed this phenomenon and even built amazingly huge temples that were designed to just capture the moment when that solstice event happened and the light would just pass through some window or some uh, crevice in some rocks and they, they would see that as a, a very holy sacred event. I'm, I'm spending all this time on this and, and, and saying all of this. I hope it's helpful to just uh, give a kind of emotional sense of the power of, of the moment that we're approaching that when we make put our attention on it, when we when we allow it to be real for us, it helps us to realize the kind of change that we're capable of in ourselves. That when it seems like it just can't get any darker, things can't get any worse, light starts to return and uh, there is a, a, a new dawn, there is a new beginning. And that, that's what we experience with the winter solstice. Um, so um, as I've talked about before in these webinars, uh, this is about focusing on two intentions, two core intentions that uh, we keep refining and we keep clarifying with ourselves. The one intention being the intention to change ourselves, to transform ourselves, to open to what it is we're seeking to let go of, patterns of thought, patterns of reactivity, of emotions, uh, habit patterns, 
in order to be more truly in touch with and, and uh, express the being that we are, the divine being that we are. The other intention being, what is it that we want to do or accomplish or, or help transform in the world? What part of the uh, infinitely varied projects that exist for changing the world, for making the world a better place, do we want to put our attention into? And that follows with that formula. If you set an intention that, and you clarify that intention, that's what will help you focus your attention. And that's what will help determine what you experience and what you, what you become aware of and what you can experience. And so in both of those realms, uh, I wanted to just uh, share a little bit of, of what I, what's come across my desk or my, my, my awareness over the last week or so. And one of them uh, relates to that first intention. It relates to the intention of what are we doing about our own, uh, our own consciousness uh, and our own uh, way of relating to the projects that we have before us. And it comes from this particular paragraph that I'm gonna read, comes from a book called Mindful Politics. And if you can read the subtitle, it says, A Buddhist Guide to Making the World uh, a Better Place. A Buddhist Guide to Making the World a Better Place. And you don't have to be a Buddhist to uh, appreciate, I think, the Buddhist sensibility of seeking to be a compassionate being. And in the case where that's applied to politics or social action, uh, that means make also an intention to bring that compassion into play in our actions in, in the world. So this one, uh, the way she describes it uh, is politics as practice. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of background, this is written by a woman named Rita Gross. The book is a compilation of a whole bunch of essays by Buddhist teachers and uh, social activists from the Buddhist world that are writing about this uh, very thing that we talk about in, in this webinar all the time. I do most of the talking, I realize um, that uh, how to integrate that inner and that outer focus. So um, here she's, she was a, a feminist activist a self-admittedly very angry feminist activist. Some of you may know people like that. I, I don't know anybody like that. Um, but, uh, and she realized she, she started practicing meditation and got very much into the Buddhist world and she became a Buddhist teacher. And she tried to, she went through a very big transformation of her, of her political action. Uh, and never really abandoning the analysis, so to speak, of what patriarchy is and how damaging it is and how that needs to change. But realizing that her anger and her um, righteousness, her self-righteousness, uh, was not particularly uh, helpful either to her or to the cause. So she talks about how do you then have a cause even and not uh, get caught in that trap. All right, so here's what, uh, what I'm reading from her. She says, there are two difficult tests of individual attainment that confront the Buddhist concerned and just translate Buddhist to whatever spiritual world you uh, are part of. That confront one that's concerned about the politics of peace and justice. Accomplishing them could be considered the cities or the powers that uh, Buddhists uh, seek of social action. One is the ability to retain equanimity and awareness while caring for a cause and in the midst of the conflict. So that's the aspect of, the, uh, of development in ourselves that we can maintain that kind of peace, that kind of actual sense of peace in our heart 
while we still care about a particular political change or uh, reality in the world, whether it's refugees, or whether it's healthcare, or whether it's the environment or whatever. And then the other one is to be able to maintain contentment and cheerfulness in the midst of the failure and the seemingly unending obstacles to any real attainment of justice, peace, or gender uh, equity. <clears throat> so that's what could be called non-attachment to outcome, uh, that we, we are seeking something in the world, something that we're seeking to make better, and at the same time, uh, we can maintain our equanimity or our peace or our centeredness or our balance, however you want to look at that, our connectedness to our true nature, despite the fact that this or that particular project might, might, just, not, might just fail. It might not uh, succeed in the outer world, at least at this time. So, um, that's, that's something to consider as a, uh, if you're looking for intentions about personal uh, growth and spiritual progress, we could say, and, and this is certainly something that I have to work on, on myself all the time. As I've shared um, my experiences with the uh, Braver Angels uh, group, uh, which brings together Republican, red people, meaning Republicans or Trump supporters or people who lean in that conservative political world and blue people who lean in the democratic or liberal world, uh, they bring them together. I attended one of their workshops and when I listened to the Republicans, I mean, I had to definitely work with myself to just not uh, fall into the trap of my habit in my mind of really judging these people in a very angry uh, way, just inside myself. I wasn't, I was even just observing. I wasn't part of the discussion. They, they allow some of these workshops to have observers to learn from. Um, so I, 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 I want to encourage you again to um, consider at least checking out the website of Braver Angels, braverangels.org, and maybe looking at some of the videos because it, it can be quite a good experience for your own practice, even if it doesn't grab you as something you particularly want to participate in. Um, uh, so, so there's that inner work, and I, I hope you're all uh, getting something out of this webinar in terms of helping you to, to clarify, to keep, keep the focus on that intention in whatever way it works for you. Um, the other uh, the other piece that I that I wanted to also focus on today is the outer uh, intentionality. And those of you that were here, um, I think it was a, a few weeks ago, I talked about a map uh, that I had developed uh, that. Uh, I I I developed in order to help us see social action, political action, political involvement in a, in a, as a complete sphere of possibilities within which you can find yourself in one of many, many different places uh, and not have to judge yourself because you're not in the place that Mahatma Gandhi was in or, or Bill McKibben is in or Mother Teresa was in, that you have your own way uh, in, in terms of your own life, and particularly at any one particular time in your life, of relating to the, the, the situation of the world, as I call it, making the world a better place. Um, and, and it's okay. It can be okay, especially, uh, especially when we're doing that, that first order of the work of, of clarifying our our own consciousness and how we're relating to whatever it is we're relating to. So it's what we're relating to that this map kind of looks at, looks like. So let me put up a screen share here. Um, not that, not that. 
this, you know. So um, just as a reminder for some of you uh, of the overall map, and if you look at this part as a sphere, uh, rather than just three lines, the three lines are intersecting, but the aim is to show that they intersect uh, like a vertical and a horizontal in, in two directions. And uh, I have three axes or continuums along which you can be. And you, so you can be in any one of these play, points within the sphere with these uh, different axes. And just to break it down, the last time I talked about it, I showed you the local to global axis which is that you, you can be focused all the way down to a very, very local uh, reality, like yourself, like your body, like your mind, and, and, uh, and focusing attention just on that is a part of the, the, the body politic, you could say, of the universe that, that we're all a part of, the world that we're all part of. And it's important. And you could expand the, the size of, of your, the focus of your attention and your activity to include your household, your personal relationships, the, the, the community that you're part of, the region, and so on, all the way out to the world. So you have organizations like Greenpeace or um, organizations related to the UN that are focusing on very global projects and, and people can join in to be part of that or some, some smaller and smaller all the way down to the very local, right down to where you are. And uh, I really feel that it's important that people are able to accept that there are times when it's just focusing on the person just or or just a relationship that it's okay that, that's allowed there's no judgment uh, and there's no uh, need to be self-critical if that's what what's needed at any given time and that can expand then to to the rest and that it's possible to ignore um, that when we get involved in political action and that's a that's a danger of a lot of a lot of political work, um, and the other, the other axis that I wanted to introduce today involves a kind of different way of looking at this, which is that with any given situation, we could call it a, a problem. Uh, we can be looking at what is the symptom, what's really the surface uh, event and want to try to treat that and deal with that. Uh, so, sort of like if somebody's bleeding, you, you want to stop the bleeding. Um, and then there, there's a, there are times when we need to kind of look at what's the cause of the, of the problem, a little taking a step back and say, why is this going on? And then stepping back a little bit further. I, I didn't have really good words to explain what it means, but there are, it's, you could look at any given situation and see that there's that surface problem, that symptom that you see, and then there's a nest of larger and larger systems that are involved in, in causing that. And, uh, I wrote an article, or actually I haven't completed it, but I, I tried to describe what I'm talking about here, and I'll, I'll just read a little bit of it. Whatever problem we look at, there's a range of increasingly complex systems that we can observe bearing on the events. At the very personal level, if you have an illness, you may focus on healing that wound or sickness at the site of the pain. Acupuncturists and holistic healers will look at a wider full body or even mind body system for the source of the healing. Others may look for environmental causes. 
due to you may be sick or hurting because of pollution in the water or chemical additives in the food contributing to weakening your immune system. And in ecology and systems theory, we're told that everything is interconnected and what appears as an isolated problem is really a manifestation of an imbalance or dysfunction in the larger system. And at, there are times, once again, where what we really need to focus on is just that, that surface problem. Another example would be if you look at water, where we're troubled by contamination in our drinking water. So maybe what we'll do is we'll buy bottled water or we'll get a water filter. And uh, so that would be relating to the symptom. And that, that's a necessary thing to do. If you lived in Flint, Michigan, uh, and you found out that the water was contaminated with lead and your children were getting this contaminated water, you had to get bottled water. If you look at the cause of the problem of the water, you find out that the streams are polluted or the pipes were polluted, and you, you start addressing that. And then if you look at the even larger systems of how in our industrial society we have waste generation problems and energy use problems and the private, you look at the privatization of the water supply and the capitalist system and we get to larger and larger systems, economic systems, political systems. And if you go even deeper, ecology minded folks spiritually, ecologically minded people believe that it's the belief systems that Western civilization has taught us about how humanity, where humanity is and what humanity is in relationship to nature that's actually causing all of this dysfunction down the line. Right? And uh, so uh, where are you? That's the question. Where are you in this dynamic of uh, relating to the symptom or the system? Um, I often think of uh, people like Mother Teresa. In some ways, Mother Teresa focused mostly, as I understand her work, on the symptom. People were hungry, she fed them. People were sick, she brought medicine or healing to them and had teams of people do that because she worked organizationally too. Um, and, and so you can see that, and that's a beautiful thing. People, people understand that. Now you think of uh, maybe Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, lived under apartheid in South Africa, and uh, he, he looked at the big system of apartheid as the problem. He, he didn't just, maybe he did in his personal life, I, I don't know for sure, but maybe if he didn't like spend all of his time trying to help so, some of the, the people who were maybe living in shacks and not getting good drinking water, getting them clean water. He worked organizationally on the system of apartheid. Nobody fault, would fault, or I don't think, Mother Teresa for what she was doing, and nobody would fault uh, uh, Nelson Mandela for working on the, on the larger cause, the larger cause. And I think what we're doing here uh, is allowing ourselves the freedom to choose from, from inside, to get in touch with our deepest nature and uh, attunement to our, the sensitivity of our body, to know what is our comfort zone, maybe moving that a little bit towards the edge of our comfort zone, but finding out what's right for us. Are we folks that, like, say, Mother Teresa, would, would feel better and would do the ser best service in making the world a better place by relating to the symptom? Or are we 
sort of oriented to look to the larger causal factors behind things and the systems that support the suffering that's going on in the world or that cause the suffering in the world. So I want to just stop the share there and come back to you. And um, I want to uh, do a little exercise, a little inner exercise to tune in just now for some guidance. in our own, uh, our finding our way of relating to these axes that I've described, this local to global and system, symptom to system. So some people have just joined us. So you'll, you'll have to just, uh, Tune in as best you can to what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I've, I've had a, a bit going on in my body where we, I, we used to use the expression of being under the weather, but I thought about that. It really doesn't make any sense. We're, we're always under, under the weather. We're, whatever it is. So sometimes we're under sunshine and beautiful day, daytime, and sometimes we're under rain, and we're going to get a big nor'easter here in a, in a couple of days, I think, and it's predicted to get 12 inches. So, but, but anyway, I, I had a little cold. <laughs> I call it that. So, so let's go back to the inward focus and Take a moment now to shift your attention. Just shift your attention. I've been <clears throat> talking about all this theoretical stuff. Thoughts. And shift your attention to the sensory experience of breathing. Self permission to let the thinking processes just be happening, and for you, your sense of self to be more primarily with the feeling of the sensation of the knowing of breathing happening. And that your whole body is breathing. Your whole body is breathing. Even your feet are breathing. Your hands. And then bring the focus of your sense of self. The sense of where you are. Gather it, move into the center of your chest, right into the heart space, right into the chamber of the heart. Feel your, that you can center there, the central column, the central axis runs right down through the center of it. And you can balance <clears throat> with left and right and front and back. It's a very literal, very physical kind of balance, as well as a, a felt sense of balance. Feel the way your spine is aligned and the way the front of your chest is aligned and 
your shoulders. And then in the depth, in the deepest central core of the heart chamber, open to that infinitely deep source of light that comes from the true nature of the one that you are, your soul your spirit, your true self, the Atman, the Neshama, and as you as you open to that infinitely deep point of light, it may be that what you feel, you feel all throughout your body. So you know in, in your brain, in your thoughts, you have some understanding of this map of where to focus attention, where you might want to focus your attention, where you might feel called to focus your attention. And you don't need to get a, an answer right now, a clear answer about where that would be. But just allow yourself to open to the reality that the guidance for where that intentionality comes from, comes from within here, comes from within that place that you're touching into right now, that you can trust it. You can trust it more than any sort of analytical process that your brain might come up with for what the world needs now from you. Let your body relax with that trust. Relax into allowing yourself to receive direction, guidance. An expression that a, uh, a teacher, a spiritual teacher that I like, Jack O'Keefe, an Irish, Irish woman, she says, mold me, shape me, use me. Mold me, shape me, use me. What's it like to just allow yourself to be a vehicle for spirit? A spirit that comes through your own heart center and be guided to then what it is you are here to do. The other expression that some use from uh, I think a more Christian sense is the thy will be done. Thy will, not my will, be done. It's allowing our personal will to align with the 
the higher well. As we said in the beginning, Mother Earth is a higher being than we are. The sun is a higher being than we are. And beyond that, the great mystery, the great spirit. <clears throat> so bring your attention back now to your body breathing, your whole body breathing. And we'll take uh, about 10 minutes if we can. Or let's see, are the people, did people leave Dodge? There we go, more people coming. So I want to give a, a shout out to uh, my soul brother, Tomas. Tom Pinkson is here. He, He's a wonderful, he, he, he came all the way out here to be with us from California. It's amazing how he got here so quickly. Yeah, um, and he has a, a webinar that he does called Live Love Now. You could look it up on Facebook and, uh, and join him. Uh, he does it on Wednesday nights. Beautiful, prayerful, beautiful, prayerful sessions that, he, that Brother Tomas does. Thanks for being here. And so any, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and, and offer just a capsule quick sense of something that came out of your, your uh, small group, uh, I'll, I'll open for that. Anybody? You have to unmute if you're going to say anything. Well, I was saying, Alan, um... I found the axes that you presented very help, helpful um, because I feel that so much I'm working on a personal level, but it doesn't, I never feel like it's very much, like I'm really doing anything, but it was, you know, sort of a relief to realize that, that, that I don't have to be a Nelson Mandela necessarily to be making, an, to having an, a positive effect in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, and and practices of uh, meditation and yoga and where we're consciously allowing our intentionality at the mental level and the emotional level, energetically, to be part of the shifting consciousness of the world, make make personal focus uh, even more powerful in terms mm -hmm. of how it affects what's going on in the world. They used to say, or people still say, think globally, act locally. Um, the thinking part, the, the consciousness part, is an important factor in what allows uh, act about the personal and the symptom to have ripple effects that, that go out through the world. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else, real quick? Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes to keep within our allotted time zone, time slot. So I want to just remind you once again of the fire that is in our belly. You can access the fire in the belly that helps us to move, that gives us the passion and the motivation to do and to move. fire in our hearts that radiate the great love of spirit that like the sun shines on all life on all beings the fire in our brains that help clear out the cobwebs and muddied confused muddled thoughts that sometimes uh, get us all in a tangle and allow that clear knowing to come through, clear knowing of who we are, what we're here for.
and to remember that we are interconnected with not only all of the humans in our lives and all over the planet, but all of the animals, all of the plants, all of the mineral, stones, crystals, soils. And that we have within us and all around us the formless spirit, the one that is the true nature of who you are, who I am, who we each are, not separate. So when we take these times to come together at the same time, even in these different locations, it strengthens each of us. I know it does me to be able to do what we're here to do with good heart. As I read from the Mindful Politics book, with even a sense of peace and equanimity, while we still act to promote or do what we need to do to promote a cause or a change of what's going on in the world, and the same peace and equanimity and balance that we can maintain when whatever it is we're trying to do doesn't work out. Non-attachment to the outcome. So again, thank you for being here. Blessings, namaste. Hope to see you next uh, Monday night for our solstice meditation. Thank you, Alan. Bye. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah, my brother. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah, everybody who's celebrating Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Festival of Lights. Yes. Miracles. Nice. Miracles can happen anytime. <laughs> Some blessed week.